Looking today at the moral animal, why we are the way we are, the new science of evolutionary psychology by Robert Wright. So uh, a little bit of background here. Uh, I started reading this book uh, a few years ago. I actually stopped and then picked it up again, but uh, originally started reading it a f couple years ago uh, because a friend of mine was trying to start a nonfiction book club uh, out here in Saigon, uh, in Vietnam, where I'm currently living and teaching English. Um, I mentioned that background for a couple reasons. One, as a way of apology for why I have a uh, photocopied version here. Uh, I would not I would not have done this if I was living back in the US. I would have gone to the bookstore and bought it or ordered it or got it from the library or whatever. But uh, because I'm out in Vietnam, it's difficult to get English books. So we, we had to print it out here from a PDF that somebody else acquired on the internet. So uh, yeah, uh, uh, apologies. Uh, again, I not something I would do if I felt I had other options for getting hold of this book. Uh, but the other reason I want to emphasize that this was a book club selection is um, just to say that this is completely out of my wheelhouse. Uh, prior to reading this book, I didn't really know anything about the subject and I'm not going to be able to critique it intelligently. Um, although if people know anything about it, let me know in the comments. So. This book was uh, originally published in 1994, which w w was, was a while ago now. So, uh, you know, among the many things that I'm not going to be able to talk about intelligently uh, is how much this book would change if it was written nowadays. Uh, how, how much stuff would be added to it, if anything in here is out of date or has since been disproven or uh, thrown into doubt, I don't know. Um, but yeah, the purpose of this book is to talk about evolutionary psychology. So in other words, why the human mind is the way it is from the perspective of evolution. Uh, the author, uh, Robert Wright, is as far as I can tell from the bio that's given to him inside the book and also from his Wikipedia page, uh, he's not actually a scientist by profession, although he, he did study this stuff back in college, studied evolutionary psychology and soci social biology. Um, but uh, he, he, he works as a journalist and as a science writer. So, um, which, which means, I believe, he's a popularizer. Uh, in other words, the, the books, sorry, the ideas in here are not his. He's just uh, translating for a wider audience what is already known inside the field of uh, evolutionary psychology. Uh, he, he references Dawkins a lot. And actually, th this was one of those things I didn't quite realize. You know, I, I like most people on the internet nowadays, uh, I'm familiar with Dawkins because, because of his book, The God Delusion, and I associate him with the new atheist movement from about 15 years ago. Uh, I, I didn't realize that Dawkins was such a big name in the field of evolutionary psychology. I, I had heard the, the name of his book, The Selfish Gene, but never read it. Uh, but yeah, D Dawkins is one of the people that uh, Robert Wright uh, references extensively. Apparently in the 70s, Dawkins was a, a big deal in this field. So uh, evolutionary psychology, there's... Um, there's a lot to talk about in this book. Um, there, there are also maybe a few assumptions you have to jump on top of uh, before you'll buy into the premises of this book. Uh, first one is you have to believe in evolution. So, uh, you know, if, you, if you're a religious fundamentalist or you have any other objection to evolution, then, then you're, you're going to get off the train uh, immediately on that one. Um, but then the next one is you have to believe that evolution uh, has had a significant impact on the human brain or on human psychology. So, you, you know, there, there are people who say, well, evolution is all fine for explaining the behavior of ants and explaining the behavior of birds, but you can't explain the complexities of the human mind 
by talking about evolution. The, the human mind is off limits. And I, I, I think there are people who say that. Uh, that's not Robert Wright's view. Uh, and uh, he, he, he does... I, I was going to say that's another uh, assumption you have to jump on before reading this book. But actually, R Robert Wright does a good job of laying the foundation to support that point of view. So even if you're ambivalent about it, you, you can still read the book, but that's one of the things he has to win you over on. But, but the next thing, aside from just a lot, aside from the general idea that uh, evolution affects human psychology, uh, then there are Robert Wright's specific assertions about exactly what human cognitive processes or what human behaviors are directly a result of natural selection. Um, it's a sizable book, as you can see. Now, part of this is because I got it printed up at the print stores here. So this is big style font on, on large pages. It would presumably be smaller and more portable if I had just got my hands on a, a regular printed book. Um, but there is so much stuff in here. Uh, and I'm not possibly going to be able to talk about it all in a 30-minute video. Uh, and ag again, 30 minutes is my time limit on this camera. Um, the uh, you know, you know, as I just just about every page of this book, I was I uh, I was either finding things that I uh, I was disagreeing with or agreeing with or things that I had never thought about before, but I, I thought that Robert Wright was making a very strong case for it. Um, I'm not entirely sure what my frame of mind was prior to reading this book. I guess it would have been confused, or maybe more accurately, I really hadn't thought in depth about the issue of evolutionary psychology. Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't a religious fundamentalist. I, I consider myself an agnostic. I believed in evolution and uh, had I had heard maybe some evolutionary arguments for human behavior before. Uh, and indeed, a, a lot of what is in this book actually is, uh, is on YouTube nowadays. I, I'm thinking specifically of Richard Dawkins, of course. Uh, Steven Pinker, if you listen to any of his talks on YouTube. Um, Sam Harris. Uh, a lot of what Sam Harris says overlaps with this book. And Jordan Peterson. Um, Jordan Peterson is interesting. He, he's obviously courting a conservative religious audience uh, with, with a lot of what he says and does. But at the same time, if you listen to a lot of his lectures, he is using evolutionary psychology, talking about the dominance hierarchy and how hierarchy was evolved through animals and stuff like that. So he, he's got a very evolutionary perspective on his worldview in spite of his religious trappings. Um, or at least so it seems to me. Uh, and yeah, the, the, the stuff Jordan Peterson talks about, about male seeking status and the dominance hierarchy, that's all in this book. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I, I, there, there's so much in here, I don't even really know where to start. Um, I, I guess I'll start at the beginning. The part one of this book is about sex, romance, and love. Uh, and that takes up about 150 pages. Um, so he, he's talking about all the things that evolution is doing to shape the way we view, we view sex, romance, and love. Uh, and the most obvious of this is sex. Uh, and he talks about the different male and female sex drives. Uh, and he talks about these in evolutionary terms. Uh, and the, the biggest difference between males and females uh, is a male can impregnate several females over the course of one year. You, you know, theoretically, if a man had sex with a different woman every day, he could impregnate impregnate a, a different woman every day, or, or at least a lot of them, depending on the ovarian cycles and stuff like that. Um, but a female can only get impregnated about once a year, or once, once every nine months, um, conservatively. Therefore, 
uh, the evolutionary result of this, and again, we, we think of evolution and natural selection as just our genes trying to spread themselves as much as possible. Uh, the, the, this, this goes back to Richard Dawkins' idea of the selfish gene, meaning that the genes actually don't care about us. The genes don't care about whether we are happy or miserable. The genes just want to get themselves spread into the next generation because that's how natural selection works. So if, if we think of evolution like that, then from a male's perspective, they, they want to have as many sex partners as possible to spread the gene. And um, from the female perspective, that, you know, they want to have sex. They, they want to propagate their genes just as much as the man does, but they want to be more selective about their sex partners because they can only take on one reproductive project a year. So, so the females got to screen all these potential applicants and say, okay, no, he's out, he's out, he's out. That guy doesn't have good genes. Uh, that guy's not going to protect me, uh, etc. Uh, and she's, she's got to choose uh, maybe just one person who is, is going to uh, have advantageous genes for her. And again, from the female's perspective, the field of, of male people who are willing to have sex with her uh, is quite large. Uh, now, from the male perspective, they've got to do all the work to convince the female to have sex with, her, with them. And that basic dynamic sets up a lot of human interaction uh, around the whole field of sex and dating, etc. Um, now, of course, right away you can see where this would be troubling from a lot of different angles. Uh, including that there's a school of feminism which re doesn't like this point of view. Uh, and I, I knew some of these people in college, and in fact I was influenced by this school of thought in my younger years. Uh, the idea that females want to have sex just as much as men, and it's oppressive to say that males want to have sex more than females do, uh, because that's reinforcing the double standard. The whole idea that it's permissible for men to be sexually promiscuous, uh, but it's not permissible for women to be sexually promiscuous is, is reinforced by this idea that males want it more. Um, and I, you know, I, I guess I, I should clarify that the, the idea Robert Wright and other evolutionary psychologists are, are advancing is not necessarily that females don't want sex. Females would want sex under the right conditions, but the female can afford to be a lot more choosy about their partner. Uh, and in evolutionary terms, the female needs to be much more choosy about their partner. Uh, so so the, the females want to have sex, but the man has to work a lot harder to, to demonstrate his worth be, before the, the female is willing to let that happen. Now, that, that is a very short summary of it. There's a whole bunch of things that will complicate this. Uh, one is raising the child. Because, of course, uh, successfully passing on your gene, it, I mean, it doesn't do any good for the male and the female to have a bunch of children if those children then just get eaten by tigers, right? Then, then the genes aren't successfully passed on. So uh, the, the female is also looking for signs that the male is going to invest his time and resources into helping the offspring that they're both going to create. Uh, and... This is something that's not true in all animal species, but has evolved in our species. And Robert Wright talks about how this, this could have evolved. Uh, and he, he also talks about uh, how there are poten potentially different cultural um, attitudes that would affect how the genes react. So, for example, if, if there's a, a culture or a scene or a generation uh, in which the, the males are not showing investment in the, their offspring, then this would encourage the women to have sex more promiscuously because it, it doesn't matter. Uh, and so that, that would explain maybe more sexually promiscuous females. But if there's a culture, or e you know, even just a, a, a mini culture, you know, like, a, you know, if a woman is raised in, in, inside a more conservative family or a more conservative town, uh, 
where where they get the vibe that uh, the men sex is to be traded for investment, uh, then the women are going to be less promiscuous. So so the, there's the the idea. The, 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 and this idea is throughout the book, not just for sex, but everything throughout the book, that the genes have different settings. So the, the, the genes kind of scope out the environment. Okay, say, okay, what kind of environment are we in? Are we in an environment where there's high male par parental investment or in an environment where there's low male parental investment? And then the genes flip themselves accordingly. It somewhat reminded me, actually, if, if you've been watching this channel, you know, know I've been talking about Chomsky's Universal Grammar. Chomsky's Universal, universal Grammar is, it sounds a lot similar. It's the idea that we're, we are all born with grammar pre-programmed into our brain. But uh, whether that grammar is subject-verb-object or subject-object-verb or whether it's uh, with a mandatory subject or an optional subject, uh, those are switches that need to be flipped once our brain kind of realizes what kind of input it's getting from the outside environment. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 the idea of kind of switches being flipped uh, and the, the genes having different settings uh, is, is all throughout this book. Um, uh, so, yeah, talks about uh, marriage, talks about divorce rates, and maybe, you know, the evolutionary tendency of men, once they get middle age, to become dissatisfied with their marriage because their wife is past the age of fertur fer fertility and he's beginning to look for other projects, p potential projects to s pass on his genes. Um, now, a, a big theme throughout this book is that this is all happening below the uh, below the level of conscious awareness. So the male never consciously thinks to himself, okay, my, my wife is past childbearing years, uh, it's time to give my genes a new outlet. The male is just, finds himself falling out of his wife for reasons he can't explain. Uh, he just has these feelings, and these, these feelings are our genes manipulating us. Uh, and, and this is all throughout this book, kind of everything we're doing or everything we're feeling is because below the surface, our genes are making these decisions for us. And uh, the, an, another big theme of this book is the, the huge level of self-deception. Uh, so we actually, because, I, because it's necessary, one of the premises of the book is that in order to function in society, we, we have to kind of observe society societal rules. So like a male can't simply say, well, my wife is too old, it's time for a new wife. But the man can say, well, I'm, I'm out of, I've fallen out of love, uh, this marriage isn't working, we're both not happy, it's time for a new, a new wife. And society will be more accepting of that explanation than the explanation for the man to say, well, she's too old and I, I need to impregnate a different woman. Um, and the, the premise is, we are better at deceiving society if we really believe what we're saying. And so our genes are deceiving us, and then we are deceiving society. Now, I, I've been talking almost exclusively about love, sex, and marriage, which does take up a significant portion of this book, but that's only one portion of the book. Uh, he talks about family and family love and siblings, uh, talks about friends and why we have friends and cultivate friends, talks about our conscience, why we have a sense of right and wrong and the evolutionary reasons for this, uh, talks about religion and, and the, how, how religion evolved. Uh, or has as a basis in evolutionary psychology. Uh, talks about uh, social status and the dominance hierarchy. And again, here it's overlapping heavily with what Jordan Peterson is saying, if, if you go watch his videos. So, um, yeah, again, so much stuff in this book. Where do I even begin? Uh, it's something, actually, I, I should have made clear at the beginning, but I forgot because it's just so much stuff to talk about, is all of this, uh, all of this evolutionary psychology is based on how we evolved in the ancestral environment. 
So you, you've, you've got to think about like not modern society living in big cities with technology, working in a capitalistic society, etc. That, that, that is not what we evolved to do. We evolved in, you know, small groups of hunter-gatherer societies out on the African savanna or, or wherever. And so, you know, because evolution happens over millions of years, all of our settings are still set back to that. And they're, they're, not, they're not equipped to deal with the modern world. And that's, to a certain extent, where so much stuff goes wrong. Um, for example, social media strikes me as a perfect example. Now, Robert Wright didn't talk explicitly about social media. This book was written in 1994, long before Facebook and YouTube existed. Um, but it's very easy to extrapolate what he's saying to the problems with social media because he talks about how important uh, status is in an evolutionary mindset, right? Because we're, we're evolved to kind of be in like this small group of hunter society, hunter gatherer societies, and it's a small close knit group. And you all rely on each other for survival. And if you get ostracized from that group, that's terrible. Your, your reproductive options are cut off because you're no longer part of the group and your survival is in danger because you're no longer getting help and resources from the group. So we are so desperate for approval from our peers. Not only that, but uh, again, this gets back to what Jordan Peterson is always talking about with the dominance hierarchy, which is in this book as well. Uh, there are hierarchies, even within hunter-gatherer societies, even within groups in which there's very little material resources. And, and Robert Wright talks about some of the evidence for this in anthropological studies. Uh, and people higher up the hierarchy get, you know, a bigger share of the meals, more resources, more access to mates, etc. So we, we are addicted to the sense of approval and status from our group. Um, we were not in, engineered to be part of these global communities like Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and Instagram where we're getting approval or disapproval from the whole world. But that's, that's the mindset our brain is still stuck in. So when people get ad addicted to checking how many likes they got on Instagram, or how many likes they got on their Facebook, that's because this stuff in the evolutionary environment was, was uh, uh, evidence of stuff that you need to survive. Uh, and both Jordan Peterson and Robert Wright talk about how serotonin is relate, released in your brain in responses to uh, status achievements. And serotonin, uh, Robert Wright says, it's complicated. It does a number of things. But it's among some of the stuff it does is it's a reward center. It's similar to, you know, the good feelings that you get from drugs or alcohol or something like that. So you, uh, people become quite literally addicted in a physiological sense to this because the reward center is lighting up when you get rewards or something like that. Uh, conversely, if somebody becomes the Twitter villain of the day, uh, you know, where everyone is piling up on them on Twitter, logically, it doesn't really matter because you can, you can say, okay, let, let's be logical about it. These are people I've never met in real life. I'm never going to see them. It has no impact on my material well-being in real life. I'm just going to log off Twitter for the day or something like that. But, but that's not the way we process it, is it? We, we, we go into this panic when we're getting negative feedback on social media because, and again, I'm extrapolating somewhat from in the book, but, um, this is very easy to extrapolate with. This is a sign that we're getting ostracized by our group community, which could mean we get cut off from the group and from food and resources, uh, etc. So it, 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 would, it would have been a life and death situation in the ancestral environment. Speaking of the um, reward centers that get released in our brain, that, that's another reason, it's another thing where modern society and our evolutionary psychology are not mixing together well because of the drug and alcohol addiction. So Robert Wright said, your, your brain has programmed these reward centers into your brain, but you're supposed to get them. You're supposed to get these chemicals released the old fashioned way, 
by, you know, uh, having sex or by getting recognition of status from your peers or by, uh, you know, undermining your enemies. Uh, but b because we've got drugs and alcohol, uh, that, that short circuit sets. Uh, I've only got five minutes left and I've barely even touched the main themes of this book. So the, the main themes of this book uh, is titled The Moral Animal, but that title is meant somewhat ironically. Uh, the, the, one of the main themes is that we are not nearly as moral as we think we are because our own conscience is deceiving us. Um, we, we have a strong inbuilt bias to justify our own actions and demonize the actions of people that we feel are, are not our friends. Um, so what, what, one of the ways that we can combat this, the, the whole idea of this book is that evolutionary psychology or the, the natural selection has made us into has kind of screwed us up in a lot of ways. Uh, it's not equipped us to deal with our modern environment. environment. Uh, it's made us into much more selfish beings than we consciously realize. Uh, and it's not designed to make us happy. Uh, happiness, according to the evolutionary psychology, is something that you're always seeking, but that you never find. Because if, if, you, if, you, if you ever became happy, then you would stop working. You'd say, oh, okay, I'm happy. Uh, but we're supposed to be unhappy um, in terms of our genes because we need to keep working and keep striving for the next level. And once we, you know, once you get to the next level, then that will mean you get more resources, more selection of mates, more opportunities to pass on your genes. So evo evolution, natural selection, never wants us to feel happy. Which uh, is, is an idea that cuts both ways, that, that idea and happiness. On one hand, obviously, it's kind of depressing to, to hear that happiness, uh, perpetual happiness, is going to be out of bounds. On the other hand, I, I think getting that information can kind of act as a re relief because we put so much pressure on ourselves to constantly try and be happy. Uh, and then we feel guilty when we're not happy. And again, this is another way in which social media is screwing us up. We, we look uh, on Facebook and all of our friends are posting pictures of themselves at the beach uh, looking very happy in their successful life. Uh, and we, we, we get the idea that everyone else is happy and that there's something wrong with us. But uh, the, the idea that there's nothing wrong with you, you you're not happy because you're not designed to be happy can act as a, a bit of a relief uh, in a way. It, it can take the stress off, the constant pressure to be happy or the sense that, you know, if you only if you only made better life choices or if you only worked a little bit harder, then you would have been happy. Uh, that, that kind of constant guilt. Um, the, the, the other part of the book, though, is it's... it's the idea of studying natural selection and studying evolutionary psychology isn't because these mechanisms are good for our well-being. Uh, it's because we, we need to know what our enemy is. And this is a phrase Robert Wright actually uses several times, know your enemy. So if, if you can see how natural selection is screwing you around, or if you can see how all this stuff in your psychology is is making you miserable or causing you to to think that you're uh, more moral than you actually are or in other ways deceiving you then with that new knowledge you can you can try and make both individual life choices and he also talks about a number of structural society changes and he he's he's very open in the book that the kind of changes that he's proposing are the kind of changes that evolutionary psychology would suggest are changes that are going to uh, not be well received by either the right or the left. Or be, to be more specific, some of the changes are not the, the right, the Republicans aren't going to be happy about and some of the changes the Democrats aren't going to be happy about. There, there are going to be some conservative changes and some more liberal changes. And he outlines these in the book. I don't have any time on this video.